And we're back. This is Stu Miniman with Wikibon.org, Silicon Angle TV's live coverage of HP Discover 2013 here in Lost Wages, Nevada. And uh, what we like to do at these shows, of course, is help extract the signal from the noise. One of my favorite things when going to events is finding those smart people out there where you can just have candid conversations about what's happening in the industry. And uh, for this segment, I'm happy to bring what I would call a Clouderati chat uh, into the cube. So joining us for this segment is Tim Crawford. He's a strategic advisor to CIOs here checking out the show, uh, you know, really an expert as to the reality of what's happening in the cloud and, and how companies should uh, you know, uh, address these new technologies. So Tim, welcome to theCUBE. Great, thanks a lot, Stu. I appreciate the uh, invite to join you here on set. Yeah, so you know, you know, one of the things I, I love hanging with the Clouderati, of course, is Half the time we don't even talk about technology, you know, is whether you're talking about travel or, you know, how you're doing on the, the tables last night. Um, but here, we're going to focus a little bit about technology. So, can you tell me, you know, what's your impression bit of the show and, and uh, you know, HP's overall messaging? Yeah, I think that, you know, kind of using some of the, the Vegas analogies, you know, a lot, of, a lot of folks in the business would say, well, leveraging IT today is like rolling the dice. Right, what are you going to get? And especially with some of the newfangled technologies when you talk about cloud and big data and whatnot. Um, you know, here at HP Discover, one of the things I found is that HP actually has some, some real interesting stories to tell. There are definitely some gaps uh, in the mix, in the messaging, in the solutions that they're providing. But I have to say, it's, it really isn't the old, tired company that, that some of us might have thought of in the past. Um, but they definitely have some work to do too. Yeah. So uh, when we talk about kind of making big bets, if I if I look at you know the overall messaging from HP, uh, two things that keep coming back to me are convergence and open. Uh, I wonder what what's your take? What does that mean to, to a CIO in today's environment? Well, there's a difference between what it means today versus what it's meant in the past too. And I think you have to put a time continuum on this as well. Um, what it means today in terms of openness is having the flexibility of wanting things like vendor lock-in, which everyone wants to talk about as a concern. Um, but it's also trying to, to find ways to work more effectively, uh, work more efficiently, leverage a multitude of different solutions from different providers, and ensure that they are going to work together, that it's not just a bucket of parts that you're then left to have to figure out how to, uh, how to assemble with your own team. And the reality is, that's a lot of work. On top of an already overflowing plate that all of us have had as CIOs in the past. Yeah, uh, so when we talk that openness a little bit further, open stack is pretty critical yeah. to HP's strategy. Uh, I, I, I want to get your opinion on, you know, first of all, where is OpenStack the maturity? How should enterprises uh, look at this technology? And uh, then the follow-up of that is, you know, what's your take on HP's involvement in that? Yeah, really good question. Um, you know, I've long since felt that, that OpenStack has just a, a ton of potential. Um, you know, I think there there's a real question as to whether the enterprise is the right place for it, especially as we start thinking about um, through time, right? So what you use today in a commercial offering like VMware or some of the alternatives. So I wonder if you could just clarify our thought answer yeah. when you we say that. So are you saying that really service providers and large web scale companies should do well, OpenStack that's where, yeah, that's where and, I was and going. enterprise use services? Yeah, okay, so yeah that's thanks. exactly where I was going, is that I think for a lot of enterprises, the question is, do you really want to get into open source? Because it is not free. There is a requirement, there's a significant cost associated with managing and getting involved in uh, open source movements. So are you prepared to do that? And that's more than just paying a bill. There's some staff and knowledge required to do that. So some enterprises will decide to do it, but I think a lot of folks will say, you know, I'm going to sit back, wait for the dust to settle and figure out, you know, kind of how this plays out. The service providers, I think, are a completely different perspective. Uh, having worked with a number of service providers and helping them through this kind of thought process, I would say that OpenStack is a great opportunity for service providers because it provides you the ability to customize your offering, provide something that um, that makes sense for the market that you're going after. 
but at the same time you have the scale to be able to dedicate those same kinds of resources that you need in order to really engage and take advantage of an open source solution that's as complex as OpenStack. Yeah, no, no, great point. Uh, we, we, at Wikibon, what we tend to look at is really these massive scale environments um, you know, are growing so much and they buy so much equipment that they are willing to, willing to spend time to save money. So they have the people that will program their environment and code things and they really look for defrilled infrastructure as opposed to the enterprise people, they, they don't have necessarily the skill set and they don't have the time. They're so burdened right. with what they have today. Right. So they will spend money to save time. Uh, we're starting to see some of those methodologies from the hyperscale bleeding into the enterprise. Mm -hmm. you know, are you seeing that? I'm not seeing that as broadly as some might tout. Um, you know, from a realist standpoint, you'll see it in pockets. You'll see pockets of folks that are starting to kind of explore the open source world, maybe play with it. Uh, in specific areas or specific use cases, but I'm not seeing broad adoption of it. Um, I'm seeing far more conversation around how could I take advantage of that or how can those benefits that open source, something as complex as OpenStack, could bring for me through the service provider channel. So if you think of it more as a channel, how can the service provider take advantage of the benefits of something like OpenStack and then pass that down to the consumer being the enterprise? Yeah, I guess where I'd poke on that is not just outside of open source, if you look how from an operational model, how uh, you know these, these giants manage things, um, you know, it, it's moving, some, sometimes some would say kind of a DevOps environment, right. but you know, it's right. the, that organizational structure, you know, uh, CIOs in the enterprise today, they're spending way too much on what we would call undifferentiated heavy lifting. Yeah. Um, we, we like to, you know, poke at, you know, uh, Nick Carr's seminal, does IT matter? We think IT can really be a differentiator today if you start th talking about things like big data and where's value creation that IT well, can help. Okay, let me push back on that and, and clarify a little yeah. bit because I think if, if you look at it as traditional IT versus the new IT model, traditional IT is dead. For, for the vast majority of enterprises today, the traditional model just does not work moving forward. And we're starting to see the, the evolution of that starting to take hold. The new model, which is still in its infancy, right? we haven't developed that really well, um, is here to stay. So if you were to say generically IT is dead and we're basing that off the traditional model, I would completely agree. I think that model is dead. But IT in, as a general foothold within the organization in terms of both the breadth and depth of access that it has and ultimately the value it can provide to an enterprise, oh my gosh, we haven't even tapped the potential yet. But only for those IT organizations that are willing to go through the transformative stages from the traditional model to the new model. Yeah, uh, so some great points there, Tim. I'm wondering if we could talk, touch on big data. Um, you know, what, what's your take on big data in general, and what have you been hearing uh, from, from HP? Is that a bright spot for them? It is a bright spot for HP. You know, I've I've had a number of conversations here at HP Discover uh, talking about cloud, talking about big data, talking about converged infrastructure. I will say that that the announcement uh, and discussions around Haven. Um, and how autonomy and Vertica play into that, as well as some of the other components that, that are going to kind of bolt on in the ecosystem they're starting to build, I think becomes uh, pretty interesting for a lot of enterprises. The question is, are we actually going to see that play out? And that's when the execution starts to play a pretty significant role um, as to whether HP is successful or not. Yeah, uh, you know, great, great points there. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, sometimes we talk about you know, where is the intersection between cloud and big data? A uh, soundbite I love from uh, Wikibon co-founder Dave Vellante is actually big data gives the cloud something to do. Uh, you know, wh wh where do you think? Yeah, I think of it a little differently. Um, big data gives IT a future. Cloud is just an enabler to quickly get there. So, you know, there are a lot of folks that are still kind of uh, battling swords or whatever analogy you want to use. Um, kind of what's the latest and greatest bright shiny object that, or newest technology that we can start to leverage. I think when you start thinking about bigger problems that we're trying to solve within an enterprise and big data being one of the opportunities in that, you start to go, you know what, these smaller issues or these other issues that we were arguing about really aren't as big as we thought they were. We've got bigger fish to pry later. So how do we start to leverage the cloud, adopt the cloud much more quickly, and then move on to more interesting things around big data? Because I think that is really where you start to talk about the intersection of where technology and business 
really hit head on. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the challenges I look at HP, you know, they joke when they put up a slide that says, you know, we wish we could have used two-point font because we have so many solutions out there to fit this market, especially even when they were talking about cloud this morning uh, in the keynote. Um, you know, when we boil it down, you know, what's your message to CIOs? Is cloud predominantly a changing an operation model? And if that's the case, you know, what, what, how, where does big data fit? Is it new value creation, you know, new ways to leverage their data? You know, yeah, how do you so, boil that down? So first off, yeah. to one of your points, yeah. having that breadth is both a good thing and it's also a bad thing because how do you sell it, yeah. right? Um, if you get focused though on cloud and big data and those particular solutions, I think cloud gives you the opportunity to leverage different operational models. But one thing that, that doesn't often get discussed but can also lead to success or failure is how well are you thinking about your process and governance changes? Because those play a pretty uh, distinctive role when you start moving from that traditional model to that new model and start putting cloud into play. So if you, so let's assume for a minute for conversation, you're addressing that, you're addressing the, the technology pieces around cloud, now you can start to build an operational model that can take advantage of things like big data. And the other thing is it refocuses your IT organization, right? So instead of being this technology organization, you truly are moving more in the direction of being a business organization, which is ultimately what they've wanted for how many years now, <laughs> right? A lot of years. Yeah, okay, so, so Tim, you know, at, at Wikibon, you know, we usually like to give advice to CIOs, and I know that's what you do, so, yeah. you know, can, can you t tell me, you know, what, what what's kind of the biggest misconception you think CIOs have today? You know, have they gotten beyond, you know, just reading about cloud in the magazines and the online journals? What would you say is their, their biggest hurdle or misconception uh, for them to be able to, you know, move forward to, uh, to take advantage of what's available today? Well, I think the, the first thing is you have to take the old paradigms and throw them away. The way we've managed IT for the last 20 years, and I've said this before, but the way we've managed IT for the last 20 years or so, it's not going to serve us well moving forward. So we need new paradigms. And that's where starting to leverage new models from cloud and big data make, make a lot of sense. Um, the, the other thing is so start looking at the stack. Start at the bottom and work your way up as quickly as possible. Look at your data centers. Why do you have your own data centers? Why are you running your own email platforms? Um, what's differentiable about that from your business to your competition? And it's not until you really get to above the platforms and into the applications and really the line of business apps that it gets really interesting in that conversation. Everything below that, it's table stakes. It's really just table stakes. So how do you quickly start to evolve? And, and again, I go back to it's an organizational shift, it's a process shift, it's a technology shift. Right? So people process technology is still well and alive, it's just taken a different form. So uh, I, I often like to ask what's the coolest technology that you've seen, but if you talk people process and, and, and technology on the people and process side, you know, where should people be going to, to learn about this? You know, you know, how do they learn from people that have been there before? You know, wh where do you point people, and what, what's a cool way to do that? Is is this where I offer my phone number? Uh, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, no. people like that. No, I think. It, but, yeah, uh, I think. You know, when you look at the when you look at the problem, and I think it's important to to understand the problem first. The problem today is not a technology one. The problem today is an organizational one. So, how do we help people through the organization? To your point. Is it a training issue? I don't think so. I, th I don't think it's a skills issue as much as it's an organizational paradigm. So how do we start organizing our IT organization? And that starts from the top down. I don't think this is a, a grassroots, bottom-up effort. I think it starts at the top and works its way down to start to organize in such a way that you are best aligned with the business and, and what they're trying to do. And what that means is you're looking at business strategy. You're understanding what the objectives of your company are and then you're saying, okay, what are we doing within the IT organization to be able to support and align with that? And if we are doing something and it's not aligned with that, I think you really have to have a heart to heart and ask yourself, why are you doing it? So the issue for CIOs today is, it's not just about cost savings. If you're in that cost savings mode, you're in the wrong mode. You need to be focused on how can you deliver greater value? And when I say greater value to the business, what I mean is, how can you position yourself to be able to, if you're the CIO, to carry a P&L, carry responsibility for a new line of business for the company? And that's, that's a very different world for most CIOs than just being a technology support org. Takes a lot of work, but 
I think it starts at the top and works its way down, and it's a mindset. It's a cultural shift more than a skill shift. Wow. So, uh, you know, we, we off the top there, there's kind of the maintaining the business the CIs do, how do CIs grow the business, how do they really transform or innovate for the business. So, you know, what, what do you see, you talk about kind of the, the, the next generation of CIOs, what, what are they going to look like in your mind? Yeah, the next generation of CIO is not going to be a technologist. And in fact, we're seeing this today um, in, in some Spartan areas. But the, new, the uh, new model CIO is not a technologist. So I think that kind of becomes a wake-up call for those of us that might be coming up through the rank and file and aspiring to be CIO. How do we get there? And it's exposure to the other lines of business, exposure out into the business in terms of what do they do? So what does marketing do? How can I start to um, do things for marketing that they haven't even asked me for? Um, and it's important that we start to, to kind of think in that, that realm. But it's the new CIO is a combination of a business leader that has some technology background, but it's not a technology leader. All right. Hey, I did remember one bit of news that we heard early this morning. Uh, to talk about the cloud wars. You know, Amazon's really the elephant in the room here, and you know, HP fired a salvo uh, that uh, the Workday is moving over to the HP cloud. Uh, wonder you, you, your take on that? Yeah, I, I think this still kind of fits in with the question around. So, is Amazon a place that can hold production? based applications for a long period of time. Is it is it really geared for that, or is it better served as a, as a sandbox environment? And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, let's let's be honest about what these different services are, are best served for. What What's also interesting about that is when you look at um, some of the HP solutions, like I've spent some time looking at Moonshot uh, that they've uh, been talking about and announced uh, several weeks back now. It's a really interesting platform, but it's not a general purpose server. It's not a high performance general purpose server. And so once you start to understand what pieces fit where, then you can start to pick and choose, okay, I need X, let me leverage that into my bailiwick of uh, different components. I need this, let me pull that in. And then you start to put together a real interesting story to be able to solve your problems. Yeah, actually, quick clarification for you. Moonshot was actually announced back in November of 2011. It, it's actually a GA product now, and I, I agree. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's built for certain applications. Uh, we're getting slow on time, and there's one thing I, I totally forgot to ask you. Um, if you look at that cloud war, especially how HP and Amazon have been looking at things, they've been fighting over service level agreements. Yeah. And you've got an interesting take on SLAs. Could you share that with our audience? SLAs are dead. Can you elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> SLAs are dead. I mean, the, the purpose of the SLA um, really has to evolve. And it's no longer a service level agreement. It really should just be an expectation setting device and nothing more. Because at the end of the day, and, and I know others have different perspectives on this, but if you think about it, you spend a lot of time negotiating SLAs. What do you get out of it? You might get some percentage of the value of the contract if you experience an outage, but usually the responsibility centers around the customer proving that there was an outage and proving uh, that the provider had failed in their duties and their contractual obligations. And at the end of the day, that percentage of the contract value pales in comparison to the impact to the company. So I think the you go through that, and then at the end of the day, you're probably looking for another provider anyway, so what have you really gained? So I think SLAs really aren't that valuable. Um, I think it's more important to think of it more as an expectation setting device than yep. An agreement. Well, well, Tim, you know, I could spend hours talking with you, and, and luckily I have had a lot of time to talk with you. This show has been one of the highlights for me, really digging into the reality of clouds, how CIOs are addressing it, and kind of those new models. So uh, I'm at Stu on Twitter. You can also reach me, Stu at wikibond.org. Uh, Tim is at T Crawford. What's your vectors? Yeah, at T Crawford's best way to, to get me on Twitter. And for or the you non Twitter can, people? Yeah, you can get me on the web at timcrawford.org. Well, Tim, uh, once again, really appreciate you coming on, having this uh, Clouderati chat in person. Look forward to seeing you at some of the other events. Uh, this is Silicon Angle's live coverage from HP Discover 2013, and we'll be back with our next guest after this break.